Hello, and welcome to Yoni Art Fest. I am your host, Laura Hollick. Joining me today is Anaya Sophia. And Anaya Sophia is a mystic, a storyteller, an artist as a, a being, being living art, and the author of Womb Wisdom, Sacred Sexual Union and relationships. And there's a whole host of books. I was trying to remember them all. There's so many juicy books. I can't even wait to get into all of this. Anaya Sophia is someone who has been leading the wave of the fierce feminine, the rise of the feminine. And I'm so excited to dive in today. Welcome, Anaya Sophia. Thank you so much, Laura. It's wonderful to be here. I'm so excited to connect with you. And, and you have written so many books and, and I've read many of them. And I was just like, wow, there's such a, a wealth and a harvest of wisdom that you have bring, you brought through and have been bringing through for so many years around the rise of the feminine and the balance between the masculine and the feminine and the healing between the masculine and the feminine and sacred sexuality. And I was thinking to myself, I'm like, how did you, how did you click into this? Like, what was the thing that sparked this journey, this epic legacy career that you have? What started all this? Yeah, I, I must confess it's quite something. It's I have been so driven, so consumed by this, not just when I'm working, but, you know, my whole lifestyle is this 24-7. And if I was to pinpoint something, you know, what could it have been that set all this off? And I would say it was a little conversation I had on Brighton Beach. Brighton's um, a coastal city in England. And I was writing away in my journal and I had the feeling that I was speaking to Mary Magdalene or to a presence that represented Mary Magdalene. And she said, come to France come to France, you, there will be an invitation, come to France. If you want to know me, come to France. Um, and sure enough, in a few days time, there was an invitation to come and teach a yoga retreat at the time in uh, an area called Rennes-le-Chateau. And I knew nothing really about Mary Magdalene in France. I knew who Mary Magdalene was. This was, you know, the beloved disciple who went everywhere with Jesus, didn't know anything about wife or sacred union partner or anything like that. Um, and the moment I went to that area of France where I now live, because that's how powerful uh, the land had an, an impression on me, everything just started to click and align into place. And um, yeah, I just went on a very, very big journey. It's amazing. It sounds like it's sort of like an initiation or like a destiny, an invitation to remember yeah. a path in a way. Yes, yes, yes. There were high times, there were tragic times. And, you know, after a few years of being with Mary Magdalene, so to speak, on the inside, I came into a very dark night of the soul. And I was just starting to get a sense that someone must have inspired Mary. Someone must have guided Mary. She couldn't have just been on her own. So I, I asked in very, very deep and humble prayer, because everything was hitting the wall at this point, I want to meet your teacher. I need to meet your teacher. Wow. And I definitely remember Mary Magdalene sort of sliding out of view and a much darker, when I say darker, I just mean dark as in color, a mm -hmm. darker way more ancient presence sort of step forward. And that's when I just knew Sophia. 
Mm. Didn't really know what Sophia was. I knew it meant wisdom. But in that moment, I just knew it meant embodied wisdom. And that one there in front of me is the embodiment of Sophia. And then things really went very, very deep, very, very mystical. Wow. And so, you know, it's amazing how you just had that insight to reach to the the source behind her inspiration, right? Mm. Because it's like, well, what what enabled her, Mary Magdalene, to to be what she was? And, and so I'm just, it's so curious how, I think sometimes we do have to reach these, you know, the dark night of the soul and these, these places where we're vulnerable and maybe there's some suffering. So we've, we've let our guard down because we had to, to open up to some deeper wisdom, some deeper capacity that could be available to us. And so then when you did connect with the, the Sophia energy, what, how did that start to teach you? How did your teachings begin then well when you're interacting with Sophia um the work is actually more based around mind and consciousness so it's about really really clearing the mind recognizing that you know thought forms and ideas and and stirring emotions could be um, set in motion by certain influences. So when you get into the story of Sophia, you start follow, following the Gnostic path, which is what I did. Um, it's like you start to see things as they really are. And that deluge of negativity and procrastination and laziness or whatever it is, could be triggered off on purpose by some very sneaky little brilliant beings um, <laughs> designed to do exactly that. Because this, the story of Sophia is to regain full wisdom. Mm. And should one regain full wisdom, you've regained your sovereignty, you've regained your liberation. You can absolutely see things as they really are. And there is a lot in place, I feel, on this planet, and especially so at this time, to make sure we, um, we do not reach that level of seeing, of knowing, of sensing, you know, with cool, sober eyes. Um, yeah, so I, I really feel that... Um, Sophia, wisdom is really streaming to the planet. It's very, very available for us to pick up on. Um, there's a little bit of a, a race against time. Uh -huh. You know, so yeah. we're getting bombarded urgh, with all the doubts and the despair and the depression. Um, yeah. Maybe because we're so close mm. to actually opening sections of the brain that have been very um, dormant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it's like we're reaching this, <clears throat> this cultural reckoning, right? Like all the things mm -hmm. that, that we didn't want to look at, didn't want to see, didn't know how to deal with, they're, they're coming like fast and furious to the forefront. And giving us the chance, you know, do we want to cultivate wisdom with this? Do we want to see clearly and the opportunity that's here? Or do we want to keep trying to just like cloak it with denial or dismissal or whatever? And so it's like we are, we're heading down the birth canal of, of like a yes. new way. And, you know, that's why I think of your work as being so ahead of, of its time in a way, because you started doing this work years ago and now it's like we're talking about it more you know there's yoni art fest and there's we're definitely talking about it more it's more in the mainstream and yet yes. it's been building for a while what do you think we need to be able to receive this wisdom opportunity to be able to pass through the birth canal and actually become wiser during these times hmm. I would say good old fashioned prayer. 
uh, praying for illumination, praying for the mind to be illuminated, praying for the veils to be lifted, the scales to be removed, to see things as they really are, to hear things as they really are, to feel things as they really are. So just praying for that. Um, you, the veil is a good word. You know, the veils that have formed upon us just by simply living here in, in the way that we do. Um, we've become so desensitized, so unfeeling, so unaware. And um, prayer has been my way of um, undoing, <laughs> getting naked. <laughs> Uh -huh. But then I've always been a big prayer. I must say, you know, since the age of, I think it was five, um, I have prayed every single day and night of my life, even when I was a rebellious Gothic teenager, <laughs> you know, dressed in black and being miserable. I'd still get into bed and I'd still have a little prayer. <laughs> so um, I, I guess I've built up this really, really strong force. It's a constant. Mm. Absolutely. It's definitely a constant experience for sure. Yes. Yeah. How do you pray? You know, I think that some people might think, oh, I'm going to sit on the side of the bed and put my hands together and head down and sort of ask God to help or something. And but prayer is like a spiritual technology as well. It's where we mm -hmm. can access the unseen and feel mm -hmm. a thread of connection, right? And in that, mm -hmm. that connection, then there's a safety. What, how, how do you pray? You know, what, anything you want to say about that? Like, what is prayer to you and yeah. how do you do it? I think I have a bit of a combo. <laughs> so um, I was trained in Kundalini yoga a long, long while ago, and it's still very much with me. So I don't teach straight classes, but the Kriyas are very much um, the science that I use myself and, and would share with others. And I know the things that work for me. So anything that involves arms in some sort of like, you know, endurance movement <laughs> and um, breath, um, combined with, I don't really enjoy too much the Kundalini yoga mantras. I prefer choirs or um, symphonies. <laughs> I'm a real music buff. I love my music. So I will use a piece of music that really, really opens things up. And so combining all of that, which is like Shakti, which is the yoga, power, dynamic, uh, passion with bhakti so you know worshipful energy is coming up longing um, yearning um, aching for and so the combination produces a lovely little elixir which makes the prayer so humble and yet so powerful so clear and direct in what I need to express Mm. And that's, I very much like to do that. I love to put, put two components together to create the third. So Shakti, Bhakti equals, well, I don't even have a word for it yet, but it's really, <laughs> it feels very good. Well, would you say that's like sacred sexual union when components are coming together and then there's a third, you know, it's almost like, exactly. yeah. So how exactly. would you describe, yeah. How would you describe sacred sexual union? Well, for me, it's three centers of the body. So sacred is the heart, sexual is the womb and horror, and union is the consciousness. Mm. So whenever we say sacred sexual union, we're thinking about totally linking those three centers together in ourselves first so we are the alchemized vessel and then we meet with another alchemized vessel 
Mm. I guess people may have thought, oh, sacred sexual union, you, you do it together with another. What I'm saying is do it with yourself first, and the other one is doing it with themselves first, then you come together. <laughs> now that's going to make a very that's interesting very juicy, meeting. absolutely. Totally. And I, I think about different sexual experiences where the partner, like being in a different place than the partner, right? And mm-hmm. And so... And, you know, sort of trying to, and of course we're always in different places. No one's going to be exactly the same, but just on some sort of energetic or evolutionary level, feeling like they're in different places, but then sort of still trying to find union. And it it's in my experience, there's this feeling of it's not satisfying. Like it's, it's not fulfilling there. Like, it's like, you don't meet, there isn't actually yeah. a meeting that happens. And yeah. in our society today, there, there's so few examples or opportunities for young people to get the chance to kind of build that union and empowerment and sovereignty within themselves. First, there's sort of this idea of being very sexualized and then having sex with somebody else and, and then sort of dealing with that, coping with it. And I've always wished that there was something when I was a kid that could have kind of helped me come into my own sexuality and discover it without it having to be for someone else, you know, and, um, you know, part of why Yoni Art Fest exists is is exactly that is starting to, to heal and build our own sexual sovereignty, our own primal empowerment within ourselves, And I know that you've been working on this and you've got things that you're doing. Where do you want to weave into your story to, what can we do about this in the world where a lot of people, they don't have the chance to find that union in themselves first. They don't know how to do it. They don't know what to do. And they're already with another partner. What, what can you say to this kind of situation we're in, in the world? Well, I can remember something in my mid-90s. I was in Britain and the rave culture was Mm -hmm. just taking off. And it was the time of like sunrise festivals, outdoor festivals. Mm -hmm. It was the times of shum. It was like trance and acid. I never knew anything like it. I went to those clubs in London and the rhythm was so perfect. You know, there was a new sound, there was a new rhythm and all the DJs and all the bands were looking for this rhythm. And of course, you know, combined with ecstasy and all the other pills and potions that were going around, (laughs) my generation, we touched in on something during that rave culture. And it was a wave, and we were all surfing the wave. Mm. Now, I didn't, for some reason, take any of the ecstasy or the other stuff that was going around at that time. But I I sensed I was still part of my tribe that I'd gone out with that night. And we were connecting. (laughs) You know, this is pre-spirituality. We were connecting with strangers and eyes and love and embracing. Mm -hmm. And it's the highest state, actually, I've ever experienced. And so it was enough to give me a taste. And then years, years, years later, I saw a great movie called Karma Sutra, A Tale of Love. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) I know what you're talking about. I had the the VHS (laughs) Mira Nar, the director. Yes. yes. Oh, totally, totally, incredible. Totally, one of my totally. favorite movies. Love it. Oh, gosh. Same here. One of my favorites. So totally. I'm watching the movie, and of course, I'm falling in love with the ladies. She's uh, the both of them are so mm-hmm. beautiful. Yeah. But then, then we meet Rasa Devi. We meet the older woman who used to be the concubine, and she's mm-hmm. teaching the little girls. Yes. And when I see her, I just want to be her. I don't want to be the beautiful <laughs> young concubine. I want to be this older one. Mm. And I want to make a school. I want to make a school of love, just like 
what was in the movie. And things are starting to align for something like this to happen. Myself and Pete, my husband and my mum have bought this massive house in the French Pyrenees. And it used to be a school, not, not a school, a holiday school for children in the region run by the Catholic Church. Um, so we've bought it. We are transforming, transforming, transforming it. It's totally in the middle of a nature reserve. There's trees everywhere. And um, it looks like that school of love is coming. No. <laughs> oh, it's, my God. It's already set incredible. up for this. It's incredible. And it's like a, a dream brought into manifestation. It's so interesting to hear how that movie had an impact on you. And now, you know, this, things are coming to fruition from what was sparked from that. That oh movie God. has, that, that did, it touched something in me. It's almost like, I think those who were seated with the, yes. the, in their purpose and their path, there's going to be something with the rise of the feminine, something with the healing of the planet, something with sort of coming back into our primal power. There was something in that movie that like activated it. And yes. I remember when yeah. I first watched it and I, I bought it on a VHS. So, and I watched it dozens and dozens of times. Like I like studied that movie and yes. it sparked this whole wave of, you know, all there in my own art, I do a lot of embodiment and kind of becoming the art and sort of working with the sensuality of the body. And, and it was sparked from that movie. And it started like, yeah. you know, 20 years of, of an art project, basically. So it's so interesting. And it's like in moments like that, movies or, you know, being at a rave where there's these cultural things that are happening and then they, mm. they activate pieces within us to then do our calling to become like, what yes. are we here to do? You know, like right now. So as we're talking, you know, the, these are activations, these are transmissions, things coming through to, to activate the next level. And so yes. right now, we're in this place where there is a rise of the feminine to restore the balance. So really we can, the masculine can evolve too. And then we can have that union because we could actually meet both of us in our power. Yes. What, what do you feel is most important right now at the, this time, these transformational times, we're in this, this process of a rebirth. What is most important I would say returning back to the mind and finding tools and ways of um, illuminating the mind daily. So actually seeking out um, a frequency of light that will literally light up all the faculties of the brain and having a knock-on effect with the consciousness because if we don't, we are going to get drawn into the TV, our friends, our family, our neighbors. I mean, it really is at a very high velocity at the moment. All the fear, the pandemic, the vaccine. Are we traveling? Are we not traveling? Mm -hmm. um, and if we stay connected to that frequency too much longer, um, I think it's going to have a very, very detrimental effect on us long term. Mm -hmm. So we have to like um, really put aside some time to bring the mind into a state of illumination. Now, mm -hmm. I tell you one way, that doesn't mean we sit around meditating like a Zen monk. <laughs> um, recently, we have just had delivery of five little goats, <laughs> which have brought in so much joy, so much play, so much happiness. So that's what I mean. That is also an illumination. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it is such an interesting time that we're in that were pushed into a type of an isolation where we can't do the things 
that would maybe distract us in the past. Like things like, oh, let's go to a movie. Those are wonderful things. But suddenly when they're not there, it's like, you know, I'm sitting in my studio, I go for hikes and the big event is going to the grocery store. (laughs) You know, it's a big outing. (laughs) And, you know, we're still in a lockdown in Canada where restaurants are closed, you know, things are still closed. And it's been so fascinating because I've always enjoyed kind of my own thinking time, my own space, but this has taken it to a whole other level where it's like you are in your own space. And yeah, people can get on the internet and things like that. And that could be a distraction, but it also, if we choose it, it can be a time of illumination. You know, it can be like, we can use this almost like if someone goes off for their, you know, 40 days to meditate or 40 days, 40 nights, you know, of something, it's like, we, we we're getting this time. Yes. to rethink who we are, what do we want to do? How do we want to be? What do we want to create? What needs to be healed? Yes. What needs to be processed? All of these things. Yes. And yes. so in that way, it's super powerful. And then on, I guess, the shadow side of it is there, we, you know, the things that come up, not every, we don't always have the skill to deal with it, which is why we've stuck, you know, pushed it under the rug or suppressed, repressed it. People don't know how to deal with a lot of the things that are under the surface. And now all of a sudden that's coming up. So any tips that you'd like to share or offer that could help in that? So in those moments where maybe we might get distracted or to choose the illumination, to choose the opportunity that this time is, Hmm. what could be like a skill, a tip, something that that we could weave into those moments to to keep opening to what is possible Mm. for me it's always movement it would be dance it would be yoga maybe not yoga because that's a little bit like oh (laughs) sometimes when I'm in a really bad state but dancing I can pretty much say yeah dancing a state and that's always a gate opener for me dancing and music and you know even if I'm sluggish and I don't want to and I'm grumpy even that can be turned into a dance Mm -hmm. you know a grumpy sluggish dance movement and also in front of the mirror you know I always always dance in front of the mirror (laughs) Um, (laughs) and you know sometimes I dance for I dance for the garden, I dance for the mountain, I dance for the animals, I dance for India, I dance for Israel and Palestine, because I do believe that if you want to connect at a very deep level to these world crises and the people and the animals and the trees involved, you can through dance. And so you can just pour yourself out for these world crises probably deeper than the level of the heart. The level of the heart, you know you're dancing at the level of the heart, but then it goes further still. And you're not even sure what level I'm dancing at right now, but it really doesn't matter because this just needs to happen. Mm -hmm. I'm so connected to this Israel and Palestine situation. Mm -hmm. Oh gosh. Um, So I dance. That's all mm-hmm. I've got. I, I'm here in France. I'm stuck. I can't do anything. And even if I could travel, I still couldn't do anything. But mm-hmm. I can dance and I can pray and I can sound and I mm-hmm. can connect with the people through the mirror. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that the levels and layers that you're speaking of to me, I think of it as like you get into a primal place where it's beyond... Mm-hmm sort of logic it's beyond you know good bad right wrong it's just like it's it's experience it's primal and so then when we let ourselves move it it's like it's a liberation itself because you're just like the energy gets to move and the aliveness gets to flow it's like the dam opens and things are moving and then health can be restored and then also the level that at that place we kind of are all connected you know just like in mm-hmm. prayer i think there's like a, a field that we're connected through that prayer state as well. But on the primal level, it's like we're connected then through the the earth. You know, it's like, we're all part of this place, right? Like we're, even though we have our own experience, we're all part of this. And, you know, we're, I think 
in some ways, probably we are influencing the weather. And I don't just mean through climate change. I mean, just through our energetics, like how if there's a a town that's like in a, a certain state of energy, probably does affect the weather pattern or the pollution level in that place. Yes. And so there's yeah. so many things in that. And so I hear that you're speaking on these levels. It's like the, for our own healing and transformation there, the prayer level is like, that's a, quite a high frequency, but then there's also mm-hmm. this primal, like at the Yoni, the womb level, the earth level, that also is part of it. And like the union of, of these two energies. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. So kind of bringing this all together and sort of bringing this into it's like closing, but an opening right now. What would, how would you like to, what thought would you like to leave us with or what wisdom would you like to leave us with or kind of to summarize what feels most important about all of this that we spoke about today from your perspective, just some final thoughts to, to bring this to a circle for right now. Well, what I'm working on right now again, is this mind aspect and experimenting with opening the mind in a feminine, juicy, beautiful, succulent, sumptuous way. (laughs) Because the (laughs) (laughs) the techniques I've come across in yoga are brilliant, but very masculine, very disciplined, very rigid, very strict, controlling ourselves, you know, for the mind to not wonder. So I've been contemplating all the work that we did with our sexuality, that methodology, that approach, you know, that sacred container in which we were held as, as we healed our sexuality and our relationship in our gender and the other gender and learn to be intimate and learn to open up trust, trustable and trusting. And I'm like, hmm, what take that approach to, to the mind? Because the mind is is an incredible, incredible erotic place. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, if you just think of that imagination of ours. Um, so instead of like you know bludgeoning the mind to open and berating ourselves when we don't do it good enough, let's take the feminine path. Mm. Let's really trust <clears throat> that unknown depth as if it was our beloved, as if it was the one we loved the most. So as we go into that dark, if we feel we're falling into the void or the abyss or losing sense of self completely, can can that be treated as a love affair? Mm. You know, in the same way we would enter ourselves or another Hmm. So that's that's, so that's my latest. That's Juicy. that's the pulse my fingers on at the moment. Yeah, succulent, oh. succulent, yeah. sensual, amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, there's so there's so much wisdom, and you know, it's like just opening up the conversation. It's amazing the, the things that come up through the mind and through the body and, and awarenesses and impulses and so on. So I'm just noticing that within my own body, just like different things coming up and kind of, I was noticing my posture as I was, you know, different things we were talking about, my posture is sort of adjusting <laughs> in different yes. moments. So it's just fascinating to, to be conscious of, yes. of how we are processing these times and being yeah. part of the creation and rebirth and using the mind, using the body, all these things. So thank you so much, yeah. Anaya. So, yeah. Yeah. So how can we learn yeah. more about you? Well, the website, anayasofia.com, social media. Um, I must say I'm less on that these days. I'm, I'm really here, you know, mm-hmm. in the mountains. And, and what we have is a and b and it's a retreat center. So, um, yeah, I, uh, my life is changing. My, my way of being is changing. It feels like 
the most potent will be an in-person meeting. I think mm-hmm. I'm going to become that that strange old mystic. <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, if you really, really want to meet me, you know, you'll find my house on the mountain somewhere. <laughs> and, um, the succulent you know, and you'll mystic. Guaranteed a bit of an adventure. <laughs> the succulent mystic. Thank you so yeah. much. Beautiful. Oh, thank you, sweetheart. <laughs> You've been watching Yoni Art Fest. I've been speaking with Anaya Sophia, and I've been your host, Laura Hollick. <laughs>